Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. And through the benefits of modern technology, Mr. Hintz and 1302 are back. I hope during these difficult times everyone's doing well and making the most of their free time. As I said before, through the modern miracles of technology, I'm able now to record my lectures so you can sit back in the privacy and comfort of your own home and enjoy learning U.S. history. The 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, has been seen as a decade of jazz, bootleg liquor, gangsters, flappers, ballyhoo, boom, and bust. But the Roar in the Roaring Twenties could also be seen as the birth scream of modern America in which its citizens rejected a rural past and embraced an urban future. It could also be seen as a time of conflict between those who were accepting of change and those who were not, those whose minds were open to new ideas and those who still clung to fundamentalist beliefs. A time when many in America accepted the new changes of the new 20th century and those who sought to some way turn the clock back to a past that no longer existed. So without further ado, let me be your escort as we navigate through the thickets of U.S. history as we talk about Chapter 21, The Roaring Twenties. So what we're seeing is there is an active promotion by the government of the economy. So with this new decade, there is a retreat from those progressive politics that we had been talking about in the previous chapters in the social change. We're moving away from that. Again, people are tired of these social experiments that just don't seem to be working. We want to get back to old-fashioned money-making, ladies and gentlemen. And a lot of these policies are reflected in the government. Oftentimes, business lobbyists dominate at this time in the United States history, as they sadly still do today. And if you're asking yourself exactly what is a lobbyist, well, they're seen as, how, how can I put it, those people who try to influence our officials in voting for certain legislation that will benefit their cause or their businesses. So these people are all over, but it is to be expected because, as you saw in your readings, there's lower taxes on income, on businesses, what we're seeing is higher tariffs, or higher, excuse me, higher tariffs on imported goods, and the quelching of the unions. So this actually does, believe it or not, uh, encourage businesses to boom, wages, wages actually rose, and unemployment declines. And this is all culminated within the Harding Coolidge administration. We'll talk also about the Hoover administration, but I want to leave that off to the next chapter when we talk about the Great Depression. So again, pro-businessmen are seen throughout Washington, and they're often appointed to high government positions. One case in point is Andrew Million, uh, excuse me, Mellon, who was a multimillionaire who made his money in aluminum, and he's been made the Secretary of the Treasury. So he is the one, the brains behind the Warren G. Harding and later Calvin Coolidge administrations, who seek to provide or promote an active economy. So again, laissez-faire jurisprudence overcomes the national state that the progressives have been pushing for. And again, laissez-faire, laissez-faire for those of you who speak French. Again, it means leave well enough alone. So again, get government's big nasty hand out of the economy and let the economy do as it will. So by 1920, all these different aspects are coming together to make the United States richer than all of Europe combined. By 1929, we have about 40% of the world's total wealth. As I said, we were talking about that first administration, Warren G. Harding, it's often seen as the most corrupt in U.S. history. Who is Harding and what exactly is going on? Warren G. Harding becomes president in 1929. He becomes the 29th president based on a campaign slogan, a return to normalcy. And normalcy was seen as a, t a term that Harding himself actually created from normality. And with this, we weren't going to do any high-minded things like Woodrow Wilson. The, war, the United States was tired of war. We didn't want any more progressive social experiments. Again, getting back to the good old American life, uncomplicated. And Harding himself was a likable but uh, excuse me, ineffectual leader. And uh, Harding in his personal life uh, is, is uh, the stuff of modern movies, I guess you could say. He could almost be a modern character. He drinks, he has extramarital affairs, he gambles. It's even rumored that he actually lost the White House China set in a poker game in the White House. And the thing about Harding is uh, he often described himself as a man of limited talents from a small town. And he likes to surround himself with those he can trust, or he thinks he can trust. And oftentimes he appoints friends his cronies from Ohio into key government positions in his cabinet. Unfortunately, things don't turn out so well by adopting this policy. 
One case in point is Charles Forbes, who was appointed the new first administrator of the Veterans Bureau. With this, Charles Forbes, uh, how can I say, benefited from selecting contractors who would build new hospitals who would kick back money to him. He also was selling narcotics to drug dealers and also bootleg liquor to gangsters themselves. Uh, another person that we'll talk about is Attorney General Harry Doherty, the Attorney General. The Attorney General was running kind of a sideline that he wouldn't prosecute criminals as long as they were paying him bribes up front through his frontman, a guy named Jeff Smith. When this was actually found out, Jeff Smith would eventually kill himself and Henry Doherty was removed and eventually jailed. The one that I'd like to talk about, Albert Fall and the Secretary of the Interior, is one of the famous scandals that's known about the Harding administration, known as the Teapot Dome Scandal. Before we talk about this, we have to also know that Harding, at the time of his death in July 1923, was one of the most beloved presidents at the time, believe it or not. And these scandals that we're talking about actually do not come out until about a year after his death. And as the scandals start to materialize, his popularity starts to slowly deteriorate into when he actually becomes, at the time, one of the most despised U.S. presidents. But at this time, here is Harding lying in state in the East Room. The scandal that I wanted to talk most about was Teapot Dome. And you're asking yourself, well, what is Teapot Dome? This was regarding the oil reserves that were located in Wyoming and also in Elk Hills, California. These were oil reserves reserved for use of the U.S. Navy in times of trouble. What the Secretary of the Interior was actually doing was he was allowing private oil companies to come in and actually pump out the oil that was to be held for emergency use only, and he was receiving kickbacks to do it. Another scandal that actually erupted after Harding's death was an alleged affair that he had before becoming president and the love child that he had fathered. During Harding's death, Nan Britton actually came up with a book called The President's Daughter in which she detailed that Harding had actually fathered her daughter Elizabeth Ann. When this came out, uh, there was a great combination of Nan Britton for doing this. This was seen as the first kind of kiss and tell book regarding the U.S. president. She was thoroughly condemned for doing so. She was seen as being a prostitute and condemned as being a pervert for doing this. But everyone who was doing the condemning of Nan Britton was also reading the book. The book was tantamount to almost pornography, and people would actually secretly place orders to their local bookstores and have them wrap it in brown paper and put it on the back porch so their neighbors would not see them actually reading this salacious book. Was Elizabeth Ann really Warren G. Harding's love child? The answer wasn't really resolved until the year 2015 when it was proven through Elizabeth Ann's grandson that yes, she indeed had been related to Warren G. Harding. So what actually happens when Warren G. Harding dies? Well, Warren G. Harding had actually taken a trip to Alaska. He was the first person, or president, I should say, to do so. And on the way back, his doctors were saying, again, another friend that he'd actually placed into a position of power, that he was suffering from food poisoning from a bad crab. Making his way to San Francisco, Warren G. Harding started having trouble in July, and eventually he passes away on August the 2nd. Word gets to his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, former governor of Massachusetts, to his father's home in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. Uh, around 2.30 in the morning, Calvin Coolidge is actually woken up by his father, who is a justice of the peace and a notary, and he's told that Warren G. Harding has passed away and that he is the new president. Calvin Coolidge dresses, says a prayer, and goes downstairs where he places his hand on the family Bible, and his father actually swears him in as the new president of the United States. After being sworn in, what did Calvin Coolidge do? He went back to bed. Calvin Coolidge, what to say about Silent Cal, and I'll get into that nickname in just a moment. Calvin Coolidge was often seen as being a taciturn person, kind of an uptight person, but in actuality he did enjoy good practical jokes and he could be persuaded to actually dress up in costume for a good photo op. Here's Calvin Coolidge as we can see dressed as a Native American chief and as the cowboy Cal right there. Also. 
case in point about practical jokes. Often Calvin Coolidge would call his secret servicemen into the White House, and when they would actually try to go and seek Calvin Coolidge, trying to find out what the president wanted, Calvin Coolidge would often hide behind desk or furniture, laughing hilariously at the secret servicemen who could not find him. So, what to say about Calvin Coolidge? Well, as I said before, Calvin Coolidge was the former governor of Massachusetts, and for many he exemplifies Yankee honesty. Uh, he's not known to be what is termed a spendthrift. He's tight with the budget, and as I said, unfortunately he's seen as cold and taciturn, silent cow. There's an often told story during a White House dinner that a lady sitting next to him said, Mr. President, I can bet you you can say more than two words and you can have this dollar bill. Calvin Coolidge turns to her and says, you lose and snatched the money right between her fingers. And so, Calvin Coolidge, he's seen now for many conservatives as kind of being uh, the golden boy, those who they would like to emulate. And he was often seen as a role model for Ronald Reagan himself because he adopts a handoff approach in the White House. He believes in being tight with the budget. Uh, he vetoes twice a pay increase for postal workers and also a bonus for veterans, but he also cuts taxes twice. And so with this, again, Calvin Coolidge is promoting business. Calvin himself would say, he who builds a factory builds a temple. So again, Calvin Coolidge is very pro-business. And with this, uh, another example of his being pro-business and believing government should stay out of businesses' his way is when he vetoes twice the McNair Hogg bill. What this bill was about is uh, legislatures from farm states were actually wanting the federal government to buy food stuff to actually sell to Europe. For Calvin Coolidge, this is not an option because this is seen as interfering in the free market. So again, Calvin Coolidge will not have any of it. By 1924, Calvin Coolidge is up for re-election and he wins in a landslide. The motto is, stay cool with Coolidge. Who is Coolidge actually up against? Well, he's running against Robert LaFalda from Wisconsin. We talked about him in our previous chapter, and LaFalda is running the Progressive Party. If you remember, LaFalda was the one who actually implemented a lot of the progressive ideas in the state of Wisconsin. And what was LaFalta calling for? Well, he was calling for, basically, uh, the public ownership of railroads, the conservation of resources, the end of child labor. So these were nothing new, right? These weren't things that were new that progressives had actually been talking about. But at this time, like I said, we've kind of moved away from those progressive ideas. And Calvin Coolidge himself denounces this and says that this is going to make America communist or socialist. This is the blueprint for doing it in America. And the landslide that Calvin Coolidge gets shows that Americans, again, are tired of the progressive politics and they want to move on. So again, his reelection it shows that America has entered into a conservative decade. The picture you're actually seeing here is the only time that a former president actually swears in a president. Here we have uh, excuse me, William Howard Taft, Supreme Court Justice, is actually swearing in Calvin Coolidge here. And if you remember in our class, we talked about William Howard Taft, the guy you guys seem to like so much. Yes, the president who did, in fact, get stuck in his bathtub. What we see in this decade in the 1920s in America is there is an explosion of consumer goods. Uh, the economy itself is based at this time, as it is still today, on consumer spending. And that's what they couldn't really understand when we get into the Depression. But I'm getting ahead of myself. And with all of these new goods that are coming out, there is aggressive advertising. Now, if you remember, we were talking about advertisers trying to turn the public opinion in favor of America for World War I. A lot of these guys were part of the CPI that was promoting America's propaganda. And during uh, the war, they did it very successfully. And with the end of the war, a lot of those guys who had actually worked for the CPI went to work as advertising uh, agents. And what are they doing? Well, again, they're promising that by buying their goods, they're satisfying Americans' desires and everyday needs. They're not so much appealing to people's intellect as to their emotions. So if I buy this, uh, let's say, this vacuum cleaner, I'm going to somehow satisfy this material want that I have within me, and I'm somehow going to be better than all my neighbors. So again, 
buying goods, again, we're not appealing to people's intellect, but their emotions. You don't want to not have this good because somehow you'll be less than your friends. And something that advertising uh, agents do still today. I mean, from the time that you wake up until the time that you go to bed, you're hit with ads constantly. And so with these ads coming out and these companies wanting you to buy these things, what if you didn't have the money to buy them? Well, that wasn't really a problem. What we could see now is this is the time when goods were actually purchased on railway pro uh, programs in which your goods were put aside and you made payments until the day that you could finally get your goods from the store or they were purchased through credit and installment plans. So again, we have to kind of go back and think in American history. Before, Americans were always very leery of being in debt. Now this is the time that Americans are embracing the idea of being in debt and not having a problem with it. So all these goods that are really coming out are really transforming Americans' lives. Things like the vacuum cleaner, the new washing machine, toasters, refrigerators, all these kind of new consumer goods, these appliances, are transforming the American home. And so what we see now is with all these new devices, these now new labor-saving devices, Americans are really having a lot more leisure time before where they spent slaving away in the homes. Now with this free time and extra income that they do have, they're looking for ways to satisfy those other needs for entertainment. Here's an example right here of transforming the American home. As you can see, here's an ad for the Leonard, Leonard Electric uh, refrigerator. Uh, before, how did people really keep their food cold before the modern refrigerator? Well, it's something called the ice box. Basically on the top was an area where you could put a large block of ice that would keep the food cold. So there was no electric motor keeping things cold within it. And again, it was all based on ice. Something like uh, the principle of putting your food in a cooler with ice. That was pretty much what the ice box was. Now with electricity and the widespread usage of it, right, we're able now to keep our food cold in these new refrigerators. Uh, washing machines. Here's an ad right here on the right. Before washing machines, before, excuse me, the existence of washing machines, how did the lady of the house actually do the cleaning of the laundry? Well, it was a very laborious process. It involved a huge tub, a scrub board, and taking soap, rubbing it on the clothes, and then scrubbing the clothes themselves, and then drying them out. Now, with this new labor-saving device, the washing machine, as you can see, only for $81.50, right? Now you just put all those dirty clothes in, put soap, hit the on button, and off it goes. And then when they're finished, you simply wring them out and hang them up to dry. So again, these are examples of these products that are changing the American home. And again, it didn't matter if you didn't have the money to buy it. Again, you can buy these things on credit or the installment plan. One of the things that come out, and as I told you about advertising execs playing on people's emotions, not so much their intellects, is Listerine. And everyone, we still have this or excuse me, this product today, Listerine, everyone knows what it is for bad breath. So how did the Listerine company get around to getting people to buy Listerine? Well, what Listerine actually did is they actually went back to medical textbooks to look up old, obscure names for things that didn't really have much context in modern America in the 1920s. And one of the things that they found was halitosis. And they make this whole campaign about you don't want to have bad breath, this halitosis. Nobody wants to have this horrible sounding, uh, almost just sounding like a disease in their mouth, right? So try Listerine, right? Cleanse your mouth of those horrible things that cause bad breath. And as you can see in the ad, it says, don't fool yourself, right? Here's this young lady because she has this horrible breath, this halitosis, right? She misses out on getting the guy she wants and her friend, no doubt, makes makes uh, a date with this guy. So again, halitosis, like it says, makes you unpopular. So try Listerine. So again, it's that fulfillment, right? You don't want to be the person who is not in with the group. So again, these advertising execs are appealing to not only your hopes, but also your fears, right? I don't want to smell around other people, so I got to try this product, right? Uh, a lot of name brands are also making their first appearance at this time. Uh, many of you may have tried the cereal Wheaties, right? Uh, whole weight, whole, excuse me, whole wheat flakes ready to eat. What Wheaties actually did was now they're trying to promote 
the sports athlete, right? The sports hero. And we're going to talk about that in this lecture. But as you can see right here on the right, there's a little boy right there. And again, this is a Wheaties ad campaign. And they're, again, they're a, a, uh, appealing to the young boy's hope of what he could someday be. And again, in the background, you see Babe Ruth. And it says, champions get many a small boy to eat a good breakfast. And if you go to the supermarkets today, if you're able to find it on the shelves, if it hasn't been cleared out yet, like toilet paper, what we see is you'll still see sports celebrities with their pictures still plastered on the Wheaties box, right? And trying to encourage kids to buy the Wheaties to be like their sports heroes by eating the cereal. Again, the breakfast of champions. <coughs> Excuse me. So... What we also see is there's a new and faster transportation coming in America, and we're talking about the car and how America's economy is really going to be focused on the automobile. And we're getting away from making things like steel and textiles like we'd seen in the past, and the car, like I said, is the backbone of the American economy. And the guy who really exemplifies this computer, excuse me, this consumer spending is Henry Ford. And I think everyone's driven a Ford or they know of someone who has a Ford. And who is this said Henry Ford? Well, he was the son of Irish immigrants and he'd actually briefly worked for Thomas Jefferson in his labs. Now, I think it's a misconception that some of you may think Henry Ford invented the automobile. He didn't. That was by Gottlieb Daimler in Europe, if you've heard of Daimler Benz. But what Henry Ford does is he actually sets up the Ford Motor Company in 1905 in Detroit, Michigan. And if you know anything about Detroit, for a long time it was the headquarters of many automobile makers. Uh, not so much now. It's more kind of a burnt out shell of a city. But at one time it was known as Motor City USA. Well, how does Ford really revolutionize the automotive industry? Well, what he does is he actually uses the assembly line in constructing his Model T's, his cars. I think there's another myth out there that Henry Ford actually invents the assembly line. He doesn't. He actually takes the idea from the Chicago meatpacking plants that we had talked about in our previous chapter with Upton Sinclair in the jungle. And so, just like in the uh, slaughterhouses themselves where they hang up the beef carcass and it's passed along on a chain different workers cut out different parts of meat so why couldn't we use the same idea in putting cars together and so Henry Ford comes up with this and actually implements this in his factory and what we see is before where it took 12 hours to manufacture an automobile now it's only down to 90 minutes and so this greatly revolutionizes the car industry. And with this, if we're able to produce cars faster, that means that we're going to be able to sell the cars at a cheaper rate, and it's going to be within the price range of most Americans. Here's Ford's Model T right here. As you can see on the left, here is the assembly line with workers putting these together, and there's the finished product right there. Now with the assembly line, where you just stand in one area and keep doing one thing constantly day in day out again it's going to get monotonous and your rate of speed is going to determine on how fast they're regulating uh, how fast the cars are actually coming through so it could be very monotonous and it could also be very dangerous if you're not paying attention uh, the Model T on the right hand side uh, Henry Ford said you always could have a Model T in whatever color that you wanted as long as it was black and the Model T really transforms America. Again, with the assembly line, we're making cars cheaper, and it's in the pocketbook of most Americans to afford one. And also keep in mind, even if they can't, through things like payment plans, they'll be able to afford a Model T. So again, driving is going to be accessible to most Americans. By 1908, as, I, as we saw when Ford actually starts his plant, he produces about 34,000 cars. And like I said, they cost about $700. But with the assembly line, by 1910, we've driven that price down to $316. Uh, that's a big accomplishment, ladies and gentlemen. And what we see is Henry Ford does something that's kind of unheard of at the day he actually increases the wages to, of workers to five dollars a day. Now why is Ford being so generous? Because this is something that's unheard of and it actually angers a lot of Ford's investors. Why are you doing this? This is driving profits down. 
It will also mean that to compete with Ford, other automakers like Dodge, Oldsmobile will also have to increase their workers' wages. So many were angry at Ford for doing this. How does Ford justify this? Ford says, you know, if we make these cars and our workers don't have decent wages, then they're not going to be buying the cars, ladies and gentlemen. So again, we're again trying to satisfy the need of selling those cars. Like I said just a moment ago, if the workers don't have any money in their pockets, they're not going to be the ones buying these cars. So we have to increase workers' wages. Uh, in the Ford plant itself, labor conditions were not that great. Often there were spies throughout the uh, Ford plants that would report directly to management or Ford himself. If you were found to be trying to set up a union, you would be blacklisted and kicked out. Also, there were private detectives working around to make sure unions or anybody who didn't complain wouldn't complain about working conditions, and if they did, they were beaten up and thrown out. So what we're seeing with Ford is something called Fordism. And when we were talking about increasing the workers' wages to $5 a day, Fordism, what this is, is mass producing something and mass consumption. So again, we're producing a lot of something, for example, cars, and people have money in their pockets and they're going to mass consume these things as quickly as we can produce them. So this is Fordism. If you have any questions, again, about Fordism, I can clarify if you'll send me an email. But what many people don't know is Henry Ford has a dark side. What we're seeing here is Henry Ford was a notorious anti-Semite, meaning he did not like Jews. For Henry Ford, uh, the world was plagued by a Jewish conspiracy. If you did buy one of those Model Ts, what you received in the glove compartment wasn't an instruction manual about how to care and drive your Model T. It was actually a book written by Henry Ford in which he denounced Jews and considered them to be a plague on mankind. Also, Henry Ford had sold throughout his dealerships a newspaper called the Dearborn Gazette in which Henry Ford lambasted Jews, complained about them. And what we saw was during his birthday, uh, he was actually presented with a medal by the German government, the Nazi government, the Order of the Red Eagle. And this was presented to other notables as well, Charles Lindbergh, and we'll get into that momentarily. Uh, during World War II, Henry Ford resisted early on trying to convert his factories to making war material. And what we saw was, as the war progresses, it was rumored that Henry Ford actually wore this medal around in his house. The Ford Museum today can't locate this medal, and it was actually rumored that Henry Ford was actually buried with it. After the war, those Ford plants in Germany that were damaged by American bombs, the Henry Ford Company actually took uh, the U.S. government to court and actually won settlement against them for having bombed Henry Ford's uh, Ford Company uh, car plants in Nazi Germany during that time. So again, Henry Ford, like I said, uh, he has somewhat of a dark side. So that kind of raises the question, have you driven a Ford lately, right? Well, like I told you, the automobile is becoming the backbone of the American economy. And owning a car was seen as this prosperity of the 1920s, right? Again, ad executives plying that ad with you, right? You have to keep up with the neighbors. You want to be the ones that neighbors can envy, so why not buy a car? And what we're seeing is with everyone owning an automobile, it's really changing the day-to-day -day life in America. So now before where people were kind of confined about how far they can go out, now they're able to travel great distances from the homes. And so you didn't have to work in the city, or excuse me, you didn't have to live in the city to work in the city. Now you could move out outside of small towns, suburbs, and drive to work. Things that we now enjoy today and take for granted. This was something new. Also what we're seeing with so many automobiles out there and with so many people driving around is it's changing the landscape of America. And so what would seem common today for us is something new to them in the 1920s. So things like gas stations, diners, things called motels, traffic lights, they're making their appearance across the American landscape. And so by 1925, what we're seeing is most local and state governments are pretty much spending about a billion dollars on just road construction and the upkeep of themselves. So again, America is driving, right? For us today, the automobile is a symbol of freedom that we can get in and go at any time. You know, we take it for granted, like I said. But this is the time when this is actually taking off. So what we see is by the end of the 1920s, half of Americans actually own an automobile. 
And if you're kind of shrugging your shoulders saying, well, you know, how is that important? Compare it to Great Britain in the 1980s because most Great Britons wouldn't own at least an automobile or two automobiles until the 1980s themselves. And so this is America in the 1920s. <clears throat> what we see is to help promote this consumer economy, cities are still continuously growing. And we talked about the growth of the cities in our previous chapter. But by 1920, what we see for the first time is a vast majority of people are living in the cities. As I kind of told you before in our introduction, a lot of people are leaving rural areas and moving into the cities. Those uh, American soldiers who had actually gone off, many of them farm boys themselves, who had gone off to war and seen places like London and Paris, they love the big cities and when they get back they don't want to go back to the rural life so again many people are now moving into the cities and it's making it more crowded than before however there is a downside to many people leaving the country by 1918 what we see is there's a decline in farm goods as people go to live in the cities excuse me what we also see is there's also a great migration from the south of african americans they're leaving the south and heading for northern cities and one of the northern cities that many are heading to are New York, Harlem in New York, Chicago and especially Detroit. Now as I mentioned before Henry Ford being an anti-Semite, noted anti-Semite, notorious anti-Semite, uh, didn't actually have a problem believe it or not with African Americans and he actually welcomed them into his plants and within the African American community themselves being a part of the Ford Motor Company meant that you got a little button that said Ford and these buttons were actually worn as a symbol of pride in the African American communities in Detroit so again there is this exodus from the south to these northern cities uh, are there any other people coming into America? With the conclusion of World War I, by 1919, immigration is resuming back to the United States from Europe. And again, they're coming from the areas, those areas that we actually talked about, Southern and Eastern Europe. What we see also is the West experiences the largest amount of growth out West. And our population by this time in America is actually growing by 59%. With this now comes a new industry, and what we see is the mass consumption and mass consumer culture. And what we saw is Hollywood really is dominating this world market with films. Uh, before, the filmmaking industry actually took place in New Jersey, but a lot of film execs decided to move out to a place called Hollywood in California. Why? Well, Hollywood also has sunshine all year round and there's different locations so it could be scenes such as a beach. If we go out it could be desert. If we go out to another part of just right outside of Los Angeles it could be forest, the hills of Los Angeles. So it was a movie makers dream come true. And what we saw was Films actually become the most popular form of public entertainment. And being silent, it meant that you could make your movies and you could distribute them around the world. And because they were silent, people in Russia, China, France, you name it, could enjoy these movies. Because if you've ever watched a silent movie, and I recommend that you do, again, they're, they're silent with music accompaniment. And usually you can put the little dialogue and little speeches of what people are saying within the movie. So again, it wasn't too hard for movie companies to do this. And they were a popular, cheap form of entertainment. And so what we see is moviegoers from small towns to big cities love their movie stars. And what we see are the movies are telling people how they should act, how they should dress, also what goods they should buy and so again this is reinforcing other areas of our consumer culture radios and phonographs are also bringing mass entertainment into the homes radios everyone's familiar with of course we still use them today phonographs eh, what we're talking about are just simple record players right so again people are enjoying listening to radio shows hearing music and they don't have to step out of their homes to do it. They can sit in the comfort of their homes and enjoy it just like you're enjoying this lecture. So how many radios are actually out there and being sold at this time? Well, at the beginning of the decade, around 1923, there's about 190,000 radios. But by the time that the decade is getting ready to end in 1929, there's about 5 million radios out there. So again, it's a popular form of mass entertainment. 
And also, what you need to also take in consideration is by listening to these programs, be it in New York or Los Angeles or Dallas or Bismarck, North Dakota, we're all having this kind of shared kind of experience, right? It's, it's not, how can I put it, me being away from somebody else. We're all kind of sharing the same thing at the same time, sharing the same emotions. And what this really develops into is this kind of celebrity culture. Uh, today, we're inundated with celebrity culture. You know, the new American dream is not to be rich, it's to be a celebrity, to have your 15 minutes of fame. And this is really where this really comes from, the celebrity culture. And the guy that really exemplifies this, and is the first example of this, is Charles Lindbergh with the spirit of St. Louis. Uh, Charles Lindbergh was the first to go nonstop from New York to Paris, France, in the spirit of St. Louis. And as he returns, he becomes an American hero, a young, blonde-headed guy, right, who went out against uh, the nature itself and conquered it, right? No one had ever done this before. Non-stop transatlantic flight. Of course, flights happen daily today, but again, this is the new kind of thing that's never happened before, and it shows this kind of American know-how and ingenuity. And what we see is he becomes the first real celebrity in America. And he benefits from the radio and also movies being made about him and interviews with him. So again, he is this first celebrity superstar in America. Um, to tell you, or to illustrate, I should say, how real popular Charles Lindbergh was, streets were named after him, uh, you name it, everyone wanted to be associated with Lucky Lindy, as they called him. If you've ever heard of Harry Hines Boulevard, before it was Harry Hines, it was called Charles Lindbergh Boulevard, but unfortunately it was renamed. Why? Well, our good friend Charles Lindbergh would also be a recipient of the Red Order or the Order of the Red Eagle from Nazi Germany. He toured Nazi Germany at the time, was impressed by their aircraft production, didn't think we could win a war against them, and he with Henry Ford were a part of the American First Movement that tried to seek to keep America out of Europe's war. And so with that, and with him being seen as being perhaps pro-German, his names were taken off of a lot of hit, uh, uh, America's city streets. Hence, in Dallas, it became Henry Hines Boulevard. What we're also seeing is the creation through mass communication of the sports hero. And with this, local idols become national heroes. So before, if you had, say, sports stars, they were mainly confined to your certain cities and they weren't really known without or outside of these cities. But now with the mass communications through radios and movies, right, now these small town local heroes become national celebrities. And this is a new kind of frontier. And keep in mind how we talked about with radios and movies, especially radios, we can listen to sporting events as they happen in real life, or real time, I should say. So if I'm sitting in Dallas, Texas, perhaps I could listen to a Yankees game going on in New York at the time and wrote, write, or excuse me, root for my best player, my favorite player, like Babe Ruth. Also, millions are crowding in to watch boxing matches and football games. And football before had kind of been the preserve of uh, college players but now this also is becoming very popular within America itself baseball will be the sport that really kind of uh, triumphs over all the other sports and it becomes a big business and our athletes they're not stupid people our athletes race to embrace this fame just like our athletes do today and just like our athletes do today they begin to sell consumer products putting their names onto products so again they can get the royalties from it. And the first real sports celebrity to do this is Babe Ruth who plays for the New York Yankees. Here's some of Babe Ruth's endorsements right here for Raleigh cigarettes and as it reads now medical science offers proof positive right no other cigarette is safer to smoke. Would anybody like to care to guess how Babe Ruth died? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was throat cancer. Also, if you look on the right, there's Babe Ruth selling Red Rock Cola for five cents, right? It's the finest cola drink I've ever tasted, according to Babe Ruth. Did he really drink Red Rock? Uh, I truly doubt it, but I'm sure he collected the royalties on it. <clears throat> what we see also is a breaking with the old morality. Uh, as political feminism faded, a feminist demand for survival survived. 
So we talked about women's rights and the right to get the right to vote. And slowly, after the right is achieved, like I said, that feminism starts to fade. But again, the want of freedom survives. And this idea of this idea of freedom surviving finds itself this female liberation in a lifestyle. And this new woman emerges, this this flapper. And who is this woman? Well, basically, she's a young woman, and now this kind of sexual freedom now means personal freedom. So again, she wasn't like her mother or her grandmother, right? She could go out, she could be seen to have a drink, she could see you to smoke or chat with guys or go on dates, cut her hair short, wear makeup. And again, the flapper really epitomizes this change in sexual behavior, being a little bit more promiscuous than what her mother or grandmother would have been. But the thing about this time is, being the flapper, going out, dancing, having a good time, it was only supposed to be a short phase in a woman's life. Yes, she could do this as a young woman, but eventually she was going to have to marry, settle down, and have kids. So again, it is breaking with that old morality. And as I told you before in the introduction, um, a lot of people embraced the new changes, but there were many who were scared by these new ideas and couldn't believe what was going on, and they stuck to the old ideas. And we'll talk about the fundamentalist revolt in just a moment. What we're seeing is traditional values in consumer culture have really changed, and those who really exemplify this are the lost generation. These members of this lost generation, who are they? Well, basically, these guys were artists, writers, philosophers who had been disillusioned by World War I. F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, to name a few. And so what they do is they're looking at the old lifestyle and they're not liking what they're seeing, life before the war. And they really attack the hypocrisies and the old values that are really confronting the new way in America. One example of this is F. Scott Fitzgerald's This Side of Paradise in 1920, and if you know anything about F. Scott Fitzgerald, he wrote the seminal work of the 1920s, The Great Gatsby, which was turned into a movie, I think, in 1979, and here lately also with Leonardo DiCaprio. Also, another member of the Lost Generation, a guy by the name of Louis Sinclair, attacks the kind of narrow-mindedness of small-town America. So again, these new changing ideas are out there, and members of these lost generations are, again, attacking the old-fashioned values that many in rural America seem to stick with. Also, Henry Lewis, like I said, another member of the lost generation, attacks the beliefs and behaviors of middle America. So again, the old way of life is under attack, and we're going to see in a moment how many respond to the new changes that are going on in America. <clears throat> What we saw was the backlash comes in fundamentalism versus modernism. Many Americans, like I said, reject the modern urban culture that many are subscribing to. And many evangelical Protestants feel threatened by these new changes, like, for example, the flappers themselves. And they're looking at this, these fundamentalists, as seeing as this is a decline of Christian American Anglo-Saxon values, right? And what they're also uh, not too happy with is Catholicism becoming more visible and also Judaism. And if you remember, we were talking about our second wave of immigrants coming from places like Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe Catholic, or Catholics, Eastern Europe, predominantly Jews that were escaping persecution from the Russians. These religions are now openly displayed in places like New York and major cities. So again, they're not very happy with this. And uh, what we see is many of these uh, Protestant denominations, they rally, or excuse me, they rail against these new freedoms. And for them, it seems that the United States is losing its way and we need to get back to the old fashioned ways of doing this. One person in point, our example right here is Billy Sunday, and here he is fighting the devil. Billy Sunday had actually been a professional baseball player until he said he heard God call him. And Billy Sunday was said to have preached about 3,000 sermons, and he took pride in the fact that he was the one, supposedly, who would preach more than any other person in the world. So again, this is Billy Sunday right here fighting the devil. Another organization that comes about in response to this new changing America is the Ku Klux Klan. Now, if you remember, we talked earlier in 1302 about the birth of the Klan and how it was broken up. 
Here, this is the return of the Ku Klux Klan. So before Ku Klux Klan originally in America had been against African Americans and those who were looking to initiate changes within the South. Now with this new Klan, the focus of hate has found other victims as well. What we see is this is mainly focused on immigrant populations and their cultures that many in rural areas find to be totally alien to them. If you remember when we talked about the war and the obsession with 100% American, right, support the America, you know, love the flag, uh, don't criticize anything. After the war, this obsession with Americanism still remains. And what we see is a lot of our immigrants' homes are visited by many within the towns that which they live in to make sure they're promoting American values, right? They're not still promoting the old ideas from Europe or they're not... I should say promoting the ideas of loving their old country from which they came. Again, be you know American 100%, speak English, get rid of those old-fashioned kind of European ideas and adopt American ideas, even though, again, this is a backlash against the new and modern. So what we see is the Ku Klux Klan is reborn in 1915, and by the 1920s, the Klan has about 3 million members. And if you think this is in the South, uh, not necessarily. What we find is there's a huge birth of the Klan in places like you wouldn't believe, in places in areas like the North, the Pacific Northwest, all over America. So this is not something confined to the South. And what we see is the Klan just doesn't target the old targets such as African Americans, but now Jews and Catholics are being explicitly targeted by the organization. They also target feminist unions and anything seen as being immoral, according to the Ku Klux Klan. So again, this is uh, a backlash to these new ideas, things that seem alien to many in America. <coughs> Resistance to change can also be found in those areas of consumer culture that we kind of talked about, those new industries specifically in Hollywood. If you remember that wartime repression that we were talking about, the censorship, not saying anything anti-American, uh, that repression kind of still lingers on. And what we see is in the federal government itself, our post office is not sending books that they deem to be up, or excuse me, they are sitting, they're not allowing books deemed to be obscene to pass through the U.S. mail. And what we see is there's also crusades against indecency. So this is not so much by the federal government as by states and local governments. Local crusaders who are going in into libraries and seizing books that they deem to be immoral or promoting anti-American things or seen as being indecent. These books are being banned, hence the term, if you look here on the PowerPoint, banned in Boston. This was referring to certain books that were seen as being uh, not promoting the American way of life, being moral and indecent. So again, these books were banned in Boston. And the biggest target for this is Hollywood. Now, why is Hollywood, or as you see in the slide here, Hollywood Land, as it was originally known, why, why are they the target of these crusades? Well, again, keep in mind what I told you earlier in the lecture about Hollywood. People were wanting to model themselves on their Hollywood stars, right? The way they dressed, looked, and even acted. So again, movies were there communicating messages to people, and people were responding. And so again, these different uh, groups that were out there resistant to change, trying to put down this obscenity, right, and cleanse America, uh, for them, movies are seen as bad and promoting immorality. And... Hollywood is like Hollywood today, right? They're a business. They make movies, and they don't want to make waves with moviegoers because if they do, what happens? They're not going to be in the movie business very long. And so Hollywood is really fearing this bad publicity, and it doesn't really come uh, at a great time when Hollywood is erupting with scandals. Today, Hollywood, you know, there's scandals all over the place. But at the time, this is something new with these movie actresses and actors. One example of this is Fatty Arbuckle, and I'll talk to you about Fatty in just a moment. To have Hollywood try to clean itself up, Hollywood comes up with the Hayes Codes in 1930, and the Hayes Codes will be in effect for quite a while in America. 
Think of it as the forerunners to G, P, J, and rated R in the movies. So again, this would regulate how long you know couples could kiss or hug for so many seconds. Men and women couldn't be seen in the same you know beds, that kind of thing. But our really example of the kind of Hollywood and its scandals and the fear that it generates and for these groups pointing saying ah Hollywood is immoral is Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. <coughs> Uh, I don't think many of you are familiar with Fatty Arbuckle, uh, but if in, we were in 1920, he would have been the mega kind of super comedy star of his day. His films were all over the place, and he found such uh, promising comedians later, such as Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, they all owed their kind of early start to Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. And what we saw was he was the most highly paid comedian and film star of his day, making I think about a million dollars a year. And what happens is, unfortunately, Fatty Arbuckle left Los Angeles one uh, day in, I believe it was, 1924, 25. I'm not sure about the date, but that's irrelevant. What you need to know is he went to San Francisco. There was a huge party in the rooms that he had rented in a San Francisco hotel, and Fatty was falsely accused of having assaulted a woman. He was tried, I believe, twice and got off. But at the time, for many Americans in those crusading groups, Fatty Arbuckle was the devil incarnate. His movies were yanked, and they were no longer shown, and even though he was found not guilty, he was still treated as someone who had actually committed this horrible act, which he didn't. In the papers at the time, again, pandering to the reader's prejudices, has made Fatty Arbuckle seem, again, like he was the devil incarnate. Later, when Fatty confronted uh, William Randolph Hearst, who had actually written all these horrible stories in his newspapers about Fatty, you know, Hearst apologized and said, well, tough luck, kid, you know, but it was just to sell papers. Eventually, Fatty will get back into the film industry, and he does sign a contract to direct a movie. However, on the night that he goes to actually celebrate, he goes back home, and he dies of a heart attack soon after. So again, this is really one of Hollywood's first big scandals, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. <clears throat> One of the things that really is well remembered from the 1920s is Prohibition. I think whenever you see movies about this time, it's inevitably with liquor and gangsters and jazz. And if you remember, we talked about Prohibition in our last chapter. And again, this was something done by the progressives, but unfortunately it had some negative consequences they could not have anticipated. Prohibition itself was was real rallying cry for those who were real fearful of change. And what happens is this prohibition raised a lot of questions, right? Uh, it was supposed to, again, clean up America, get Americans drinking less, right? Dad doesn't get drunk after getting his paycheck, goes home and beats the wife and kids. Again, it was supposed to bring Americans together moral or morally. However, what we see is Prohibition does the exact opposite. Prohibition becomes uh, the agent through which drinking becomes very popular in America. And what we see is throughout this time, bootleggers, those who are supplying illegal alcohol, selling it to people, a lot of times they're not really producing quality alcohol that's safe to drink. A lot of times these drinks are poisonous. They have formaldehyde in it or it's wood alcohol. A lot of times these people, young people drinking this, like I said, it's now fashionable to drink and skirt the law. A lot of times they're drinking alcohol that will leave them blind if it doesn't kill them. And so what we see is this is really encouraging a large widespread disrespect of the law. And it's seen by historians today as being the first kind of great scoff law and another reason that, you know, Americans, you know, kind of thumb their noses at, poli at the police today is can be traced back to this. And historically, as we've seen, Americans don't like to be told what to do and Americans love their drinks. So again, with this widespread encouraging of drinking and skirting the law, speakeasies, these little secret bars sprout up everywhere throughout the United States. It's just honeycombed. In some cities like New York City, for example, there will be about 3,200 of these little secret bars. And people knew where the drinks were, and a lot of times local law enforcement agencies and even national law enforcement agencies, the Prohibition Bureau, were highly corrupt. And due to bribes, they often looked the other way and didn't enforce the Prohibition law. So what we see is prohibition really turns organized crime 
and to big business within America. And it turns our mobsters into national heroes. Before, you know, when we talked about the Wild West and people loved their outlaws, Americans loved their gangsters too. And what we see is vast criminal empires are actually created in the United States because of prohibition. One example, I think the one example everybody thinks of is Al Capone in Chicago. Here is a speakeasy right here, and it kind of demonstrates what we're talking about. And it was kind of the drama and the secrecy that made going in. It just kind of drew people in. As you can see, there's a guy, and he's knocking on the door. And a little slit's open, and you can see an eye. And the guy or girl would say, Joe sent me. You're using some kind of password to make entry into it. And as they get into it, you know, everyone's drinking, having a good time, jazz music. So, uh, again, speakeasies, they were all over the place. If you're familiar with a club called 21 in New York, it started out itself as a speakeasy. And most of these speakeasies were run by notorious gangsters that their cities boasted of. Um, here, right here, is an alcohol bust right here by the police. Uh, a lot of times, however, your local police were on the take by a lot of these uh, gangs and gangsters themselves. Uh, even the federal bureau that was created, the Prohibition Bureau to stop alcohol, uh, was again itself rife with corruption. And what we saw was, with a well-placed bribe, a lot of these gangsters were running these vast bootlegging empires that were netting in millions of dollars a year. Here's one of the gangs right here on the right. It's the Purple Gang of Detroit. As you can see, they're all under arrest and they're trying to avoid having their pictures taken by their, concealing their identity with their hats or keeping their heads down. So again, I think there's also kind of a misconception <coughs> excuse me, to think that this was all the mafia out of the New York. Uh, no, Ma the mafia is in the New York itself, but individual cities throughout themselves are controlled by their own kind of local gangsters. Case in point is Al Scarface Capone from Chicago. And as you can see on his face right there, he displays two slash marks from a straight razor. When he actually insulted a man's sister, and the man was actually the brother, and he sought to uh, avenge his sister's honor by slashing his face. It's one of the reasons Al Capone has to actually get out of New York, because the brother's looking to kill him. And he makes his way to Chicago, where he comes under the tutelage of a guy named Jory, uh, excuse me, Johnny Torrio, who brings him in into organized crime in Chicago. And eventually, with Torrio leaving after a failed assassination attempt, he turns over the bootlegging and prostitution em em excuse me, empire to Al Capone, who runs it. And Al Capone himself is pretty young. This guy's in his early 20s, and so uh, he's this kind of flashy, flamboyant man. You know him when you see him, and he doesn't take pains to kind of make anything secret. And if you know anything about organized crime, uh, you want to keep everything secret or you'll become a target of the federal government. And these were all lessons learned by future gangsters by seeing what happens to Al Capone. Uh, one of the things that kind of finally brings uh, the death knell to Al Capone is the gang violence in Chicago. Uh, gangsters shooting one another, it was just kind of seen by most Americans as, you know, business as usual. It was a price they were willing to pay for their bootleg alcohol. But the gang violence in Chicago really reached a climax with the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in which hitmen, allegedly linked to Al Capone but never proven, went in and massacred the North Side Gang, a gang that was a rival to Al Capone's South Side Gang. Where was Al Capone? Well, he was in Florida actually talking to a district attorney. So again, nothing can really be successfully pinned on him, but everyone knew that it was the big guy himself who had ordered the hit. With this, President Herbert Hoover made it his mission to make sure Al Capone was put behind bars. Eventually, what actually gets Al Capone is not his alcohol violations or his murders, but not paying his taxes. He got actually 10 years by the federal government and was eventually sent to Alcatraz, where, due to a case of syphilis, his mind was pretty much gone and he was released early, and he dies in Florida in 1947. What we see is by 1928, Calvin Coolidge decides he's not going to run again. He doesn't even tell his wife. All he does is walk down to the White House gates, gives a note to the press, and says, basically, I choose not to run for 1928. So who are the Republicans going to choose as their candidate? Well, a guy named Herbert Hoover had actually served as Commerce Secretary under Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge 
has been tapped by the Republicans to actually run. The Democrats themselves choose a guy named Al Smith, who had been governor of New York and was Catholic. Uh, what we saw was, on a lot of the issues, neither Republican or, nor Democrats really differed that much. But what we saw was most of the attention really fell on the personalities of our candidates, the religion, religion and social issues. Uh, Herbert Hoover was seen as being someone from kind of rural America who had actually pulled himself up through his bootstraps and made himself a millionaire in mining and who had went to uh, have kind of a great public service career and later feeding refugees in Europe and becoming Commerce Secretary in the United States. Al Smith himself was kind of seen as being, uh, again, Catholic, Irish, son of immigrants, uh, Al Smith himself favored a repealing prohibition where Herbert Hoover was in favor for it. And so again, what we saw was it was kind of a coming down of voting along the lines of what we were kind of talking about before, about the changes in America versus the, the traditional ways of doing things. And what we saw was Smith himself wins about 12 of America's largest cities, and Hoover overwhelmingly wins by a landslide. And also keep in mind... Uh, this is before the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression. So again, the Republicans themselves have been seen as being great towards business. Again, times are great, wages are up, unemployment down, business is booming. So again, they're wanting to continue on with this with Herbert Hoover. So what we see is with Hoover winning, Smith's coalition that he'd actually cobbled together because... On the other side of it, those who didn't want to vote for, or those who didn't want change voted for Hoover, but those who favored the changes tended to go to Al Smith. And so what Smith was able to do with the Democratic machinery was cobble together these different coalitions that brought people together throughout the United States. And what this will do is lay the coalition, or excuse me, the foundation for the Democratic coalition in the 1930s when we talk about Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of our lecture. I will, as soon as possible, get the lecture recorded for the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, if you have any questions, like I said, feel free to email me at any time. Again, my office hours, my virtual office hours, are Monday, or excuse me, Tuesday and Thursday between 1 and 2.15, our regular class time. So, again, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, when we originally made this lecture and presented this in Celeste, uh, a lot of you guys weren't there due to various uh, school activities. Some of you were there, the vast majority of you weren't. So I went ahead and decided to redo this and record it for you. Again, guys, stay safe out there. Uh, there's a lot of nasty things going on out there. Uh, be safe. We'll get through this. As you've seen through American history, we've gotten through a lot of difficult things. And this is just one more thing that we'll get over. Again, history in the making. Once again, guys, have a good night or day if you're watching this or evening, and uh, I'll see you next lecture. Thanks.